A very warm welcome. My name is Nick Jones. I'm here today giving behaviour advice in connection with Pet Plan on this lovely Sunday afternoon. After all the dreadful weather we've had here throughout the UK, today it seems to be a complete change. So today, as you can see, we've gone heavy with the props. The theme is autumnal. Um, I admit I haven't actually carved this pumpkin, but I have got a little uh, game on here, which we could do a little bit, and I'll explain more of that later. Uh, I've dug through, I've searched back through <laughs> October and November and all my old photographs, as you can tell, people laugh at me, but I love <laughs> taking pictures of uh, mushrooms and fungi. That was a fly agaric, that red and white one. Highly poisonous, don't eat it. Um, so we're all ready, we've even got a candle on, same candle as before, it says sea salt, so it is all going on, autumnal is the theme, uh, so we'll roll with that. So uh, behind the camera it's my lovely helper Neve today and we're going to run through some of your questions and I will do my best to answer them for you. So uh, also can I add in that if you would be kind enough to like and share the video that helps greatly. Now, one final indulgence, it was little Ruby's birthday, she was one year old on Friday and as you uh, may have seen her before, I'm going to let her in and have a little uh, hello on camera. So, okay Katie, my other helpful helper, hello, come here then, let me pick her up, oh yeah, so here's Ruby, uh, so she was, as I say, one on Friday, <laughs> she's looking like, why am I just being held up looking at Neve like this? No, you don't realise you're live on Facebook. Okay, so this is little uh, Ruby. She's a miniature golden doodle in case some of you are wondering. So she's an absolute poppet and, uh, you know, she's the result of a lot of <laughs> hard work for us in the last 12 months. But I'll, I'll pop her down. Hey, what do you think? Is it all a bit strange? She's stuck for words. Unlike me, I'm not stuck for words. I'll let her out. If you call her, please, Katie. Ruby. Good. See, it's all highly choreographed <laughs> here. So let's jump in, Neve, and your first question, please. Okay. The first question comes from a lady called Sue, who says, how can I train my Springer door not to pull when out walking? She is just shy of a year old. Springador, Springer Spaniel Cross Labrador. So you have this slightly bigger Spaniel. It's a, a highly energetic breed, of course. And uh, yes, all breeds need to walk nicely to heel, of course. But the Springador, well, you will know a little bit more than average. Um, look, there are a couple of different ways in which we can address dogs that pull. Fundamentally, we should, I believe, be looking at good technique and. Um, what's the word? Conveying good technique over Facebook Live is, is difficult because it really is one of those elements where I'd say, well, look, let me observe you walking with the dog, then let me jump in, see if I can get your dog walking to heel better, and then hand back to you, and then we can sort of maybe do a bit of back and forth. So that's how I tend to do it in uh, reality when I'm actually with the person. But there are a few sort of uh, highlights that I could make for you that may help. Uh, so although I've made the point about good technique, that is most important, but there are actually some really good harnesses on the market now and that can make a nice difference for you as well. Um, I'm of course not really able to specify any brands, um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to do that today. If you want to contact me separately you can do so and I can give you a bit of further guidance. My email, nickjones at alphadogbehaviour.co.uk if you would like a bit more further advice on, on uh, brands of harnesses. But there are also quickly two basic types of harness. One is a fixed harness where it's got the buckle and some adjustments around the chest and waist and, and it's a fixed harness. Uh, and then we have a anti-pull harness where usually when the dog is pulling some element of that harness will restrict the dog and guide the dog physically back into you and so this can take a lot of the power out of the dog. For, for determined and powerful pullers an anti-pull harness can actually make a world of difference. So whilst uh, sometimes equipment comes under uh, unfair 
criticism really. Uh, some uh, harnesses, anti-pull harnesses in particular, can really make the world of difference. And then, by the way, we would also look, because I always want, um, it's, not an, it's not imperative, but I think it's always nice if an owner can walk a dog nicely on a regular lead with a regular soft broad collar like a, a fabric or a leather collar and even if you do choose to go and use a body harness an anti-pull body harness by the way I don't recommend a fixed body harness for dogs that pull because in fact it enables them to pull you even more strongly if that makes sense they can pull you even more because they're they've got they can lean into that harness and actually pull you if you look at the sort of harnesses that sled dogs use for example you'll see exactly what I mean so that's it um, the, 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 the top the, just to set the scene here is that we have ideally a dog that's walking on a, a traditional leading collar but that's a personal thing for me uh, two different types of harness, a fixed harness and an anti-pull harness. It's okay, in my view, to use an anti-pull harness and ideally throughout the coming weeks and months of using it, we could aim at transitioning back to a regular lead and collar. Okay? Um, here's some other thoughts for you on the subject of pulling. Most dogs will be pulling at their most a strong level at the point of leaving the home. This is on the assumption that you put the lead on your dog, leave the front door, walk to the park and then walk home. That is true for probably a majority of dog owners. We have others that may go straight into the car, go on a journey to a park and then use the car to come back. So pulling may not really be an issue for those dogs or at least they don't have a chance to practice it. So Leaving the house can make a big difference. If you open the door and let your dog just pull you straight out of that front door, then really you, you're on the back foot, literally, from the very outset. The front door or the back door, the gate, wherever you're leaving the property, these are your opportunities to slow your dog down. Because usually, of course, the, uh, a dog that pulls is a result of excitement. OK, so if we can temper that excitement and, and lower the dog's expectations, uh, then that will help you greatly in the future. So what do I mean about this door business? As you walk up to the door, so forgive me, this is my invisible dog and invisible door, uh, but most people get the drift. Rather than to open the door and just let your dog pull you out, open the door an inch. If your dog is, some dogs will respectfully wait and if so, good. Uh, but if your dog is a puller out of the door, that's where, where I'm really looking at. Open the door an inch, your dog will look to either push or walk through it. But of course, because of course that's what you've always done. Just carefully shut the door. Watch your dog's nose and paws, especially if it's got like a, a ledge at the bottom of the door and that the door cut, cuts across it so you can catch nails that way. Not that I thankfully ever have, but just be careful. So opening and closing the door a bit initially, your dog will be confused. Two or three times he will fall for it. He will go to fill that space. Eventually you'll see that your dog will back up and look at you as if to suggest, well, something's different, what's going on? That's when you know you've got the beginning. Open the door more and more on your successive efforts with the dog not going through that doorway. OK, so you need to take your time. When you think you've got enough room to have your dog say at your feet, you could be saying wait or stay as you prefer. If you think it will help, you could do a sit or even a down. Don't usually do a down, but there's no reason why not. It's just having this bit of calm control here at the doorway. My exit is here. I can then slip through that exit, I won't come off camera, and then you are actually ideally standing over the threshold and you're looking back at your dog. And your dog would be inside the house or let's say inside a porch area, something of that nature, because uh, I realise it's different for everybody. Once you've got that, you if depending on your dog, if your dog is quite calm and polite, it's unlikely that your dog will push past you. But if your dog's a bit of a chancer, and will push past or try to then block the dog with your leg if necessary you can bring your dog back in and start again okay but once you've got this position you're holding the lead here it's draping down to your dog count to five in your head 
and two, three, four, five. And then when you're happy, you can say, okay, come on. Now at that point, your dog is also likely to have a bit of um, an excitable uh, explosion again. So we need to just maybe settle the dog. If you have a p pathway to walk down to the main gate, then try to deal with some pulling there, okay? And then use the gate in exactly the same way, opening and closing the gate. This all may sound a little laborious, but it's well worth, especially, uh, it's well worth doing this, especially with those of you that do have dogs which are quite ardent pullers, because this little technique can make a world of difference. A lot of people think that addressing pulling is actually done during the walk, but yes, it, it is, but actually we can do probably a very large percentage at this doorway exercise. Now this is something that I have personally learned over nearly 20 years and I have had many dogs that when we studiously address this doorway element, it puts the dog in the right frame of mind and then the, the, because the dog then is calmer, it's more attentive, it can take some input and direction from us. Okay, and then we're much, much more likely to enjoy a nice walk together. So. Uh, there will be some gaps in my description and that is primarily looking at the real little fine techniques of maybe uh, how to address your dog when it is pulling out and about. Just so I don't avoid that completely, I use a somewhat traditional method of simply stopping, waiting for the dog. If the dog's bigger and very, very active, I may stop a little more suddenly. I may shuffle back a couple of steps, but we're not doing anything to harm the dog. We're not, by the way, doing anything, and this always applies uh, in, in my own approach, but no shouting, no rough handling. But we are trying to guide the dog back into uh, a behaviour that is much more conducive for a pleasant walk. You know, dogs that pull badly, depending on their size, can be uh, very distressing and uh, actually painful for the owner as well. I've met many people with shoulder problems and back problems and maybe they end up actually not walking the dog at all because of this problem. So it seems like such an insignificant and minor question but actually a dog that pulls is hard work and that dog is also in my experience more likely to go on and do other unwanted behaviours such as uh, off the top of my head excessive marking, making the walk a bit heavy going, um, and sniffing, excessive sniffing, maybe zigzagging and pulling the owner from lamppost to lamppost to wheelie bin and so on. So it can become all quite hard work. A dog that pulls heavily and is out in front of the owner significantly could also lead to that dog, depending on the dog's disposition, to maybe jumping up at people or just being a little less under control with people and of course other dogs or other animals. So a dog that is walking nicely to heel, that's looking good, that's genuinely content with its position next to the owner in some sort of sense of communion, uh, if that's the right word, is, is a really big deal and it's well worth uh, affecting and putting into place. So do I capture, because in my enthusiasm to give you a, a full answer, I sometimes even drift away from the question, but I think we've covered that, have we? Yeah. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much for that opening question. Um, allow me to uh, offer a, um, a, a little idea to you folks. So I can give your dogs today a Halloween spooky name. Now I need from you please, and this will come into Neve really, so I, I won't see it personally, but if you could give me the month that your dog was born, or, or pet, any pet, and the colour, then I can come up with a great answer for you. For example, my little Ruby, who you saw at the beginning, her name is Foggy Broomstick. Go figure. So, well, uh, any, any months and colours, throw them over. I'm, I'm sure Neve will put a couple to me throughout today. So, uh, and, um, good. So, Neve, what do we have next? Uh, so, following on from the theme of autumn, we've had a couple of fireworks questions. Great, okay. Um, so, I'll, I'll put them all together. Um, we've had Barbara who says, uh, I have a cross between a Bichon and a Shih Tzu, mm. and he is uh, dreadful at firework time. I feel so helpless. Medication has helped in the past, but is there anything I can do? Mm. Uh, Linda has said, my dog is so terrified of fireworks. 
I have tried everything, plugins, medication and so on. Um, he shakes and pants and tries to hide behind things. His heart races and I feel like it goes on every night for about a month. Mm. Um, and then Bronwyn has commented mm. saying, my dog barks from all the time, works go off. Okay. Thank you for those. So, the, fire, the subject of fireworks, uh, well, it comes around every year, doesn't it? And, it? and it comes around reliably. The difficulty with fireworks is that it isn't as we might hope or assume. It doesn't just take place over one weekend with organised uh, shows. It's something that can actually start anywhere from now onwards, because especially the... Uh, uh, you know the change of the light and the hours and we're getting more darkness and autumn is upon us fireworks just seem to be fair game uh, wherever you are and of course the more built up an area you live in the more likely you are to see and hear them uh, and going back to sort of the duration of the fireworks season is that it can last well well into Christmas and into the new year so we're often confronted with a couple of months of fireworks and then we have uh, depending on where you live as well, some sort of other festivals that use fireworks. So it can be a real problem for those of you that struggle. Now where we live it's reasonably remote but we do get one big public display once a year and on that one night per year I put my big boy Max who's downstairs, he's not 100% today but he, um, w we've just concluded that the best thing we can do, because it is only one day a year, is to put him in the car and we drive into the countryside for 30 minutes and then come home. So from our, for our point of view, the impact isn't too great. So there is a common theme in the points that were made, though, for those ladies, which was basically saying that we've tried everything. You know, we've tried tablets, we've tried... Uh, this, that and the other and those are all things that can really help. I, in anticipation of this subject I just made a couple of notes with some subject headings that I'd like to run through because it is a theme I think uh, people could apply to their dogs even if there isn't such a big problem because it would be good practice anyway. But at the end I'd like to place a little emphasis on thinking about maybe not just dealing with it now because you're all of a sudden it's in front of you but thinking about maybe how to prepare for even next year and that may seem quite an outlandish thought but in some there are preparations you could make now but your window is somewhat curtailed because ideally we would be looking at this maybe uh, three four weeks ago okay because you need time to introduce your dog to the main concept which I'll develop on which is desensitization. If we can desensitize our dogs to the sounds that the light is very difficult, that's more easily managed anyway, but if we can desensitize our dogs to the sounds then life will be a lot easier for you and that does take time and practice. The method you'll be glad to hear is pretty straightforward but it does take time and effort, okay. Um, so just make sure I'm not jumping ahead of myself too much. So the common theme, yes, was that, you know, we're, we're sort of here all of a sudden in fireworks season and it, it can just sort of think, what do we do? So let me run through some of these ideas for you and we'll we'll able to expand on a few as we go. So some of them are going to be more obvious than others, but the first one, walk them during daylight hours. It's much less, you are much less likely to encounter fireworks being released in the daytime. It, it can happen. Um, I would tend to avoid places where you know that youths might congregate because that is probably the most common reason for somebody letting off a daytime firework. So think about the location and also do not, especially in the genuine firework season, that, that peak week don't take them out in the evening, and I know that's going to be harder said than done for some of you. Um, close windows and curtains. So we do that here um, because that will uh, dampen and darken, dampen the sounds and darken the light. Okay, so that can make a big difference. Uh, okay, put on some music, sort of ties on nicely with the last idea. We can just about turn our TV up quite loud. And, and sort of kid max mostly and that we can pull it off but we've actually concluded that we take him out for that period but putting on some loud music or um, putting on the TV quite loudly can be good but it will need to be something quite active 
um, musically or televisually, okay? Create a quiet space. Now this helps some dogs more than others. Some dogs will naturally go off and look for a hiding space. I remember a customer years ago, their, their dog was very determined to go up into the airing cupboard and to sit there and, and wait it out. Now I don't have a problem with that at all, provided that you, know, you have a similar space that's appropriate for your dog. And if your dog is indicating to you that a certain space is where it would like to go, then provided it's okay with you and the layout of your home, then why not use that space? Uh, and then we could think about, uh, without going off into too much detail, but I, I do like the idea of trying to soundproof uh, spaces and to try to make it as den like as possible. If your den you can't see from here but I've got like a corner under the desk or something under the stairs or under a table uh, or, or in a little gap in between a couple of sofas provided it's appropriate for your dog to go into then we could cover the top and the sides we could maybe get some cardboard sheeting or some old blankets and really try to sort of cocoon it off for the dog okay and that's something you could introduce ahead of time as well very good if your uh, if you know your dog likes to go and hide somewhere okay so this may also help some dogs more than others but you could if your dog is very food motivated you could provide a, a really tough appropriate chew for your dog or you could get like a, a hollow rubber toy and you could stuff it full of food and maybe freeze it and, and make the dog work on it for a, a, a long period or you could have a, a succession of them lined up ready for such events especially if you have uh, wet food in it you could put it in a bag and chill it or if you know your dog's really good at working on these sorts of devices you could freeze it as well and then you could just quickly grab it out of the fridge or the freezer and give it to your dog at the last moment so you that will help some of you but not all of you because I realize some dogs won't eat or chew when when such noises are being um, fireworks are being let off Ensure your dog is microchip. Now this is really about the eventuality. Hopefully touch wood it won't be necessary for you but should your dog get out of the property and, and he gets himself in a bit of a panic then I, being able to identify your dog is really useful. So having a, uh, a, a name collar where it's easy to read a phone number uh, or some contact details but also making sure your dog is microchipped which they should be anyway, but to double check on that is a uh, really good thing because of course there are many dogs out there that were uh, are probably not microchipped prior to the law when it came in uh, not too long ago. So microchipping, if you think that's relevant to you, do consider it, okay? Uh, show them that you're not bothered. So what this means is that when your dog, let's say your dog is distressed about the fireworks, we need to sort of play it cool a bit. There, there are mixed opinions on this, but I do tend to fall in the camp of playing it cool. What I would avoid doing is giving your dog a lot of fuss as if to reassure your dog when it is looking anxious. Um, it could be argued that, that you, you responding to your dog in that way is not going to help it. Now, in the spirit of balance and fairness, I have had some customers say, well, actually my dog does respond well to um, reassurance. So in light of that, because I want to be as helpful as possible, not, not st stuck to some kind of dogma in my eye, uh, head, that if you find that a bit of reassurance does help, then, then by all means do so, but be careful that you're not being uh, what I would call too much or too effusive. Just keep it calm, okay, low key. Somebody once gave me the story, which I thought was quite good, which is along the lines of if you uh, are on a plane flying and you're experiencing heavy turbulence, you know, the first thing we often do is look at to the, uh, the the staff on the plane. Uh, they're not called staff, are they, Neve? What stewards. They? stewards and stewardesses, <laughs> yes. So you would, um, because we'd be checking them because they fly every day and we'll be looking at them to see how concerned they are. So um, that, you know, it, there was some thinking that dogs take a similar um, approach. You know, they check out their surroundings. They're looking at their owners. Is this Is this something I need to be worried about? Okay. Never shout at your dog. So attached on from the last point, if your dog is getting distressed, 
try to remain calm, try to, um, you know, of course, we, we want to bring all of these ideas together roughly so that you should find anyway that your dog is not becoming so uh, distressed that you are also becoming um, a bit panicky and find that your voice is raising. Um, there's a little side note here that comes into mind. I remember an owner once that was quite determined to put their dog in a crate during firework periods and the dog uh, I think could cope in a crate for the best part but then when fireworks were going off and the owner wasn't present the dog was really getting in a mess and was hurting itself trying to get out of the crate. So supervision of your dogs which could be easier said than done for some of you but supervision during the firework season is really important as well so they're not getting uh, they're not harming themselves basically and, and certainly don't leave your dog in a crate if you think it's getting in a bit of a tiz okay and finally uh, plan well in advance so what this means and I, I won't go through the full uh, sort of protocol here but According to some stats with the RSPCA, about 45% of dogs do stress over the firework period. And I should think that that could even be quite conservative. I should think it would be over half personally to, you know, to something along the lines of two thirds. But anyway, the point is here is that this is what I was saying about looking ahead for next year, because what it doesn't require a year's worth of work, I would, uh, November 5th, so come sort of times about September, for people are able to do some work September onwards, there is an approach where you can buy some commercially available CDs and on the CD is some pre-recorded tracks of fireworks and on some of them as well that you'll have fireworks and then you might have transport like buses, planes, tractors, cars, that sort of thing. Then you might have some domestic things like crying babies, vacuum cleaners, all those sorts of things. Very good for puppies by the way to play in that socialization period whilst they're open to it you know they don't really have any concept of what a firework is they're not really in that fearful state so doing it with a puppy is a good by by the way um, but what's importantly is it we we play each day or certainly four or five days a week some tracks from the firework cd but you play at a barely audible level so if on a if you have like a digital reader it might be level one two or three so you think where the dog is only just picking it up now if your dog is food motivated and many are so i will sort of elaborate a bit on that you can provide whilst playing the cd uh, or you can download mp3s as well by the way online if you look on either sort of uh, apple system or pc system you can download individual tracks that you would probably pay for okay so that can be quite good because it overcomes uh, we are moving more to towards downloads than i'm you can tell i'm a bit sort of got cds in my head still well, i'll have to make the transition soon um and we can then play those tracks whilst allowing our dog to work on some sort of chew uh, or maybe if your dog is fed dried food, you can get open up devices that they can push around and slow release toys. They're really useful. Um, or if your dog is fed a wet food, you can get like a rubber hollow device and stuff that with its soft food. If your dog is really good, as I mentioned earlier, you can stuff that device and give it to the dog. Uh, sorry, freeze that device and give it to the dog on the floor that way, okay? So we're, what we're trying to do is to play the soundtrack to the dog whilst bringing in a positive distracting element. So the dog is barely aware of the sounds to begin with, but we can distract alongside it. You will need to hang around to observe your dog's behaviour because that obs obs those observations will allow you to, de de to determine that actually we're seeing some forward movement and improvement over time. So the basic gist is that you you have the distraction device, you have your sounds playing and that you do this over each successive period um, and when you think your dog is coping at that volume level you can just tweak it up a bit more and give yourself something like a month, two months of doing this until you get to the point where you think well I'm playing that at pretty good volumes now and my dog is not reacting to it negatively but that you know the dog can hear it most dogs you'll see them if you observe them they might stop they might tweak their ears a little and think hmm 
and then carry on hopefully. If your dog stops and you've just turned the volume up, you might need to come back and spend a few more days at that level. So your dog will, to a degree, uh, dictate the pace of your progress on this one. How are we doing for time on this, Neve? Does it feel okay yeah, about really my pace? About half an hour, yeah. Good, got to pace yourself, Sue. Um, so that's good. Now, if you, the idea is that ultimately you can play that music or that track at reasonably got good volume without your dog being too distressed. The other thought is to ensure that the system you're playing that track on is fairly decent. I once went to a home with a tiny little stereo and it was playing on a little disc at the top uh, some fireworks tracks and the dog was taking zero notice and I could easily identify that it was just basically the system that was used. We, we then took the same disc, put it in the DVD player for the home entertainment system and that did press the dog's buttons and we then had everything in place to address that dog and to desensitize the dog over the coming weeks and it worked. So I find that yes, whilst all of the other things you can do such as herbal calming remedies, uh, uh, various sprays that we can set up. There are like jackets we can put around dogs to give them like a, a, a physical comfort. These things can help, but they're not usually the solution. The biggest thing I find that I can offer somebody is that elaboration upon the desensitization program. Now, naturally, if I was working with somebody uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, then we can put together a nice little program that's absolutely uh, designed for that dog and that owner whilst taking into account the types of food that the dog is on and the chews that it likes and what have you. Okay, so I hope that helps you. I think that's the top and bottom, but I, I do appreciate that fireworks are a very distressing time virtually every year for many people, but if, it, if you are one of those people, uh, and I know there are always exceptions to the rule, but if you're one of those people that goes through the same distress for prolonged periods every year, I strongly encourage you to look into uh, desensitizing your dog to these sounds because it is, uh, so to speak, all in the head, okay? And if we can change the dogs, uh, the way your dog relates to those sounds, then um, actually it could be like night and day for you. Occasionally people pop up and say, oh, my dog loves fireworks. He'd, he goes and sits in the window. I literally have had this and he goes and sits in the window and watches them. So as they say, go figure. But uh, if, if that is you suffering each year with your dog, then I think there's no need to do so. And I do encourage you to uh, take up that desensitization route. So Neve, what we... else do we have? have some spooky names. Oh cool, spooky names. Yes, uh, so Barbara says that her dog's born in November and is a brownie grey colour. Okay, we're gonna go for November. Yeah. So it's a crawling Casper. <laughs> Casper being the old uh, joke, yeah, the, <laughs> the old ghost joke. Yeah. Where did that come from? Uh, okay, have we got any more? Yes, oh, cat. Good. Uh, yes. She says her dog's born in June and is black. June. You've got Crazy Pumpkin. That's a bit more like it, isn't it? That's a bit more like it. Any others? Uh, yes, February. It's just ring me here now for I the know. next <laughs> half an hour doing cr spooky names. Um, February and chocolate. I'm going to go... Um, was there... Uh, chocolate, no, I'm gonna go brown. Fe so it's a phantom Casper. <laughs> so there we go, folks. Uh, any more of those, feel free to throw them in. This is actually posted on uh, Pet Plan's uh, Facebook feed. So if you'd like to uh, go in and make your comments there, that would be good as well. Um, okay, so um, Barbara, Barbara, one of the ladies, yes, this question. thank you, Barbara, um, has also asked. Um, we have a rescue dog that we have had since May. She started becoming very barky and nipping at our feet. We have tried ignoring, we've also tried crating, treating when she stops, but um, I was wondering whether this is her wanting to play, as she does have plenty of toys but seems to prefer our feet. <laughs> well, uh, she doesn't say how old the dog is, does she? No. Um, right, firstly, the subject of ignoring bit of a pet subject for me but I'll keep it short. Far too many 
unwanted behaviours are ignored and because it seems to be the thing we should do. And of course, as a result of us ignoring it, the dog is able to carry on doing it. So it's a real catch-22 with ignoring. I do think ignoring has it, its place. And for me, it tends to be more along the lines of really young puppies. And if, they're, if the puppy is doing something we don't want them to do, then very often we can ignore it, you know, like barking or... Year in November. Oh, thank you, Barbara, for elaborating. <laughs> so it certainly fits that idea of it being a young dog, a year old next month, uh, which I can relate to with Ruby being a year old as well. So ignoring, uh, well, as you've discovered, I'm preaching to the converted, but this applies to so many people with so many behaviours and their dog is doing things which are definitely in the realm of unacceptable, let's say, um, and th th of course that can go from mildly unacceptable to this has got to stop immediately. Um, and, and the trouble with ignoring is that it allows the dog to carry on with behaviours that we would rather it didn't. So that's the subject of ignoring. So we need to stop ignoring it, don't we? That's uh, my conclusion. You've also tried treating it when it stops. Now, that's you're on to something there but we need to put in something before it. So we're gonna discard ignoring. You've got the treating when it stops, so we'll call that step two, but what we need is step one. And we, for step one, we need a, a, an appropriate interruption, let's call it that much, and uh, a redirection, okay? This is very, keep it very simple. There's far too much complicated thinking around dog behavior. Uh, so why don't you in the home, especially at times, well, only when you're present, but allow your dog to drag a lead in the house. Um, that lead will give you some control immediately. So as soon as, let's pretend or imagine that you're walking through the lounge, your dog is in the lounge, it's got a lead on and it does what you expect it to do and it goes for your feet and starts biting your feet. Step on the lead, pick the lead up, you now have control of your dog. At the same time as you lift up the lead, I don't want you to do any checking, but I just want you to lift up the lead and to firmly remove your dog from the room. There are admittedly two or three different ways you could address this, but this seems to me relatively low key, but should, with some real consistency on your part, address that behaviour. We can then do a couple of things with your dog. It depends on what would, works best with your dog, but option A is that you could walk the dog quickly, don't say anything, walk the dog out of the room it's in and, lead, and drop the lead and therefore leave your dog but behind the door and leave it there for one minute. This is called a timeout. And uh, I'd just stand the other side of the door and count the minute up. Once the minute is up, you, um, assuming your dog is calm and quiet, which it should be, if it isn't, wait a bit longer, but if it's calm and quiet, go through the door, lift up the lead and bring your dog back into the room. So that is a very low key, but it, it is a bit of a, a negative outcome for the dog in as much that the dog is finding himself or herself alone, which dogs being such sociable creatures and the dog will know that you're in the other room, it will become a bit frustrated with itself really. Uh, especially when it realises after, say, timeout number two or number three, because it can take two or three for the penny to drop. The very first timeout, the dog will just think what's going on. But after timeouts two and three, it will begin to understand that there, there is th th that the timeout in is in itself a uh, a result of its poor behaviour towards you in the other room. Your other option is that you can just pick up the lead, bring the dog closely into you, you could sit down on the sofa, you put your own dog into the sit position or into the down, be sort of firm-ish with your voice, I, and I'll give you a demonstration, it would be sit or down, okay? So that's as loud and as firm as you need to be, but we are trying to put a bit of a red light in front of your dog saying that is not acceptable. And it really is something that should stop at this age anyway. And then you could sort of maintain that position with your dog again for that minute. So in a way, it's more like a timeout as well, but it's done, it's carried out at your feet. When the minute is up, you can then have some engagement with your dog. If, of course, your dog resorts back to that unwanted behaviour, then you can repeat that little timeout process. So it sometimes, depending on the severity and, you know, again, 
on one hand we think oh it's just a one-year-old dog nibbling at our feet but actually that behavior could in some dogs with some breeds depending on the, all the various dynamics it could be a really serious behavior and enough to potentially uh, you know reduce some people to tears so we can have even within the subject of dogs biting feet it can be very very low-key not something to worry about all the way up to something quite serious and so the point I was going to make there is that we w there are so many variables that we need to take into account okay um, so the good old-fashioned time out it, it's it's well tried and tested it's non-invasive for the dog it's uh, you know we're not losing our cool in the process and most dogs will learn from that quite nicely um, you could use a helper as well so another little method is I could be let's say sitting down here on the sofa with the offending dog but it's already on a lead and but sitting nicely and I could ask my partner or my guest or if there's a particular person which can be a bit uh, picked on by the dog and this because this can happen certain dogs will target certain people because they'll know they're a bit more vulnerable um, is that we we get this person to walk up and down up and down and we can keep the dog's attention and to reward it for leaving that person alone we could then begin to get a bit more sophisticated so we might drop the lead or even take the lead off if you're feeling confident you could uh, just keep the dog's attention on you and just treat periodically it as a reward for not going for that person's feet um, and just to follow your nose a little bit with the situation on an organic level if that makes sense so that you're just working at all the different little elements of that behavior until you think do you know what I think that as a behavior is she's not doing it any longer so those are the sorts of approaches I would take with that um, so thank you for that question it's Barbara isn't it yeah yeah so not only do you get the um, answer to that Barbara you also get your spooky named uh, dog name today so it's a double thumbs up um, so we've had a question for from Georgina um, and she said uh, hi Nick, can you tell me your thoughts at all on, um, from a behavioural point of view, on neutering to help with behavioural issues? Okay, what a great and also what a loaded question. But I, I'm up for that because tomorrow, little Ruby, who you saw at the beginning, goes in for her little preliminary check at the vets before she is probably spayed on Tuesday. You, uh, a bit of useless fact for you but I can relate to your thinking anyway so <clears throat> look every dog should be looked at on its own merits because male dogs and female dogs uh, are of course different and can display different behaviors as a result of them either being entire or neutered I you know I could talk it so much length about this but it's um, it's so it's hard to know where to start I think without sort of putting myself into a, a, a difficult position where I, I'm coming across about yes you should or no you shouldn't because that isn't the case it, as I said it should be done on, on an individual basis I would encourage you to discuss it with your vet and ideally you the, the, the vet you're talking with is somebody that you know and trust and that you have some sort of relationship with and that you can uh, have a you know, an intelligent back and forth about the various pros and cons of neutering your dog. Um, and then, of course, if there are any, because you don't mention any, but if there were any particular behavioural issues that you just might think um, are helped reduced or even addressed through neutering, then that could be an option as well. So that's the best way I think I'm going to answer that, is seek advice from your vet, speak to a behaviourist, you're very welcome to contact me. Uh, the only reason I'm being a little bit vague is that it, I'm not getting any specifics on the subject, but every dog is an individual. Um, I personally, to elaborate a little, do uh, neuter my dog, so I castrate and, uh, you know, my boys and neuter the females, so, uh, or spay the females rather, so that's something that uh, I do do, and um, I find that on balance that that helps the world go around a bit more easily. Okay. Um, Barbara has asked a question. Go for it, Barbara. Your, You're on a roll. On, going, on your advice that you gave. I need a third thumb. <laughs> yes. Go for it. Um, she's asked, uh, she said thank you. It is like having a toddler all over again. Um, I know. 
but she said, do you recommend a different lead to the one you use for walking when doing the lead and prime out? Um, that's a perfectly sensible question. I wouldn't worry too much. I understand that some people will have a special lead for training and a lead for walking. Um, I think it, it, if your dog walking lead is a bit heavy and if it has any sort of metal rings on it, I wouldn't use that. I usually favour for what I call a house lead or a house line, something about this long, uh, which is a regular lead. And I would just get the thinnest, cheapest lead you can from the pet shop and avoid it having any uh, metal clips in it. So when the dog is dragging it, it's nice and quiet. And that uh, again, if, it, if it's free from clips, it won't get sort of snagged under the door. Uh, just to reiterate, if I didn't, th that lead should be removed when you leave the house. So when the dog goes to bed at night or if you leave the house, the dog is unsupervised, please take that lead off. Um, but, you know, you shouldn't take these things for granted. So I hope that helps. And thanks again, Barbara. Lovely to have you here today. Um, so Hannah has asked, um, my collie cross lab is a year old now. Yeah. But she won't stop jumping up at people. Uh, when they come into the house, how can I deter her from doing this? Okay, well here's another very traditional question that comes up time after time, but such an important one. Uh, only this week I went to Manchester, or last week went to Manchester to look at uh, a, a, a newly acquired rescue dog that was, uh, you know, not as settled by a long shot as it could or should be with visitors to the house. Now, your absolute basic requirement is when people come in the home is that a lead should be on your dog and of course you'll need to be holding the lead so that you're able to exert a little bit of control because excuse me but if your dog is completely free and somebody comes in the house what control will you have other other than to sort of brush the dog off or to say oh ignore him ignore him well that's all good in theory but we as the dog owner should be taking control of our dogs so so a lead on your dog as your guest enters the house prior to your guest coming to the house and at the point of them entering ask them or remind them to ignore the dog so your guest will be helping you by playing it low key and ignoring and you will be doing your bit by doing the controlling okay which is holding the lead um, and, and addressing your dog's behavior there I don't want any big uh, chastisements to take place I don't want any big yanking it's just if your dog is jumping up at somebody you will need to bring your dog off so don't f fret about using the lead to control your dog ask your dog if there is some jumping up, use the word off. Okay, a lot of people will say, get down and all this sort of stuff, which yes, okay, it might work for some, but if we introduce that unique word, because not many people use it on balance, I find, but if we introduce that new word off, at the time you're bringing your dog off another person, that can be a useful new command. Now, another nice little tip is that often, if a dog is jumping up at people as they enter the house, there is often, I find, the owner of the dog uh, is having overly excitable homecomings and also there is uh, jumping up on the owner as well or owners or members of the family when people come home. So if it's happening with family members then it's going to happen with guests, it's almost guaranteed. So, and I can relate to this with all of my dogs, I've always insisted that if, if you know, this is my workspace in the day in the week and if a dog comes in and it wants a fuss so I ask it to sit first and once it's sitting and that will generally take a couple of seconds and they know anyway they come in and they sit automatically because they you know we've always done it that way that they'll sit and once they're sitting I can fuss them so when you come home ignore only long enough for your dog to come to you and to be sitting okay this isn't an, an ignore forever it's just a moment it's more like um, a deference rather than a complete ignoring and we're just pushing it back a few minutes okay once your dog is calm enough uh, then we can say come here then sit down hold the collar maybe thumb under the collar whilst the dog's in the sit position this is a simple but excellent trick and then we can 
give the dog some calm fuss there. If the dog tries to jump up, this hand is relaxed, but if there's any jumping up, oh, no, sit back down and we can respond to it really quickly. And so that day-to-day -day training in, in members of the family is a really good way of addressing jumping up. If the dog jumps up on you, then you too will be using that off command. Then we can reward the dog for what we do want, which is all four feet on the ground, uh, or in the sit or the standing position, uh, provided we think the stand isn't going to result in, a, in another jump, if that makes sense. So work on what...